Senator Roland Mullen is substituting for Senator Victor Byhan. Before we begin, can I remind members that in the, con in the context of the current COVID-19 restrictions, only the chairman and staff are present in the committee room, and all members must join remotely from elsewhere in the parliamentary precincts. The Secretary can issue invitations to join the meeting on MS Teams. Members may not participate in the meeting from outside the parliamentary precincts. Please mute your microphones when you are not making a contribution, and please use the raise hand function to, indi to indicate. Please note that messages sent in the meeting chat are visible to all participants. Speaking slots will be prioritised for members of the committee. The topic for this morning's meeting is alleged issues in the horse racing industry with representatives of Horse Racing Ireland and the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board. In the interest of full transparency, I wish to acknowledge at the outset that this series of meetings on alleged issues in the horse racing industry were called on the foot of recent allegations made in the media. In order to give all parties a fair hearing, the person who, who made those statements was invited to appear before the joint committee, but they have they have chosen to decline the invitation. Although such an engagement would have been beneficial to our discussion of what is a very important issue for a significant Irish industry. It is their right not to participate and they are not answerable to the committee. It needs to be said that we are not a committee of inquiry, so we are not here to judge the veracity of statements made or explore any allegations or wrongdoing against any person. Our only objective is to establish what systems and processes are in place, to see if they are up to top international standards and discuss any policy issues arising. I wish to remind witnesses and members that I will not allow criticism of anyone, in, partic in particular anyone who is not here to defend themselves, and I remind you of the parliamentary practice that you should not criticise or make charges against any person or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. I would like to welcome to this meeting Mr Brian Kavanagh, CEO of HRI, Mr Dennis Egan, CEO of the IHRB, and Dr Lynn Hilliard, Chief Veterinary Officer and Head of Equine Anti-Doping of the IHRB, Mr Niall Cronin, Communications Manager, IHRB, and Dr Clive Pearce from LGC Laboratories Newmarket. You are all very welcome to this meeting. We have received your opening statement, which has already been circulated to members. All opening statements are published on the Oireachtas website and are publicly available. The Committee has agreed that each group be given 10 minutes to present their main points before we go into questions and answers. Before we begin, an important notice in relation to parliamentary privilege. privilege. Witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence you are to give to the Committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to acquire a private privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or, or in such a way as to make him or, or it identifiable. Participants in the committee meeting from a location outside the parliamentary precincts are asked to note that the constitutional protections afforded to those participating within the parliamentary precincts does not extend to them. No clear guidance can be given on whether or to the extent to which, the to which their participation is covered by the absolute privilege of a statutory nature. I now call on Mr Kavanagh to make his opening statement on behalf of Horse Racing Ireland. Mr Kavanagh. Uh, Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the invitation to appear before you today to discuss the issue of integrity and drug testing in Irish horse racing. As the committee will be aware, the equine sector is an important contributor to the rural economy, with Ireland ranked as the leading exporter and seller of thoroughbreds in the world. Despite our small size, Ireland plays a significant role globally in the horse racing and breeding industries. Ireland is the third largest producer of thoroughbreds in the world, and Irish trained and bred horses compete successfully in many of the major races worldwide. Trade in Irish bred horses is estimated at a figure of 300 million per annum. As such, the reputation and integrity of the product is of paramount importance, 
So the question of drug testing is an important one with significant funds invested annually in this area. The horse racing industry in Ireland is governed by three major pieces of legislation. The Irish Horse Racing Industry Act 1994, the Horse and Greyhound Racing Act 2001, and the Horse Racing Ireland Act 2016. This statutory framework sets out that the racing regulatory body, which is the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board, is responsible in the first instance for anti-doping and forensics. Section 39 of the Irish Horse Racing Industry Act 1994 provides that the IHRB shall be solely and independently responsible for making and enforcing the rules of racing, shall provide adequate integrity services for horse racing, and shall make all decisions in relation to doping control, forensics and handicapping. The Horse Racing Ireland Act 2016 provides that Horse Racing Ireland is responsible for the overall administration, governance, development and promotion of the Irish horse racing industry and for guaranteeing funding to the racing regulatory body to carry out its functions through an integrity services budget, which is agreed annually. In 2021, this budget amounts to 10.3 million euro. Horse Racing Ireland is committed to high standards in this area and our strategic plan from 20, for 2020 to 2024 has as one of its key priorities to enhance our domestic and international reputation through world leading standards of integrity and equine welfare. Specifically, HRI sees its role as ensuring that the IHRB has sufficient resources, both financial, human and capital, to carry out its responsibilities to the level expected of a major racing nation. And we support the IHRB to constantly improve their capacity in this area. In this regard, Horse Racing Ireland has progressively increased its funding for these activities, established an industry-wide anti-doping task force to examine and make recommendations regarding best practice in this area, ensured that all Irish samples are tested at an internationally accredited laboratory, promoted the concept of authorised officer status to enable testing at non-licensed premises, and supported be international best practice reviews of activities in this area. HRI works with the IHRB to ensure that its ambitions are supported in the area of doping control and the integrity services budget is subject to a quarterly formal review at executive level. The IHRB has presented on this matter to the Board of Horse Racing Ireland twice in the last two years, while Ireland is a full signatory to Article 6 of the International Agreement on Racing and Breeding. This is a formal agreement between global horse racing authorities, which commits countries to meeting best international standards in drug testing and forensics. While drug testing is an area where you can never be complacent, Horse Racing Ireland takes assurance from the following aspects of the IHRB testing programme. All winners in Ireland are tested, focusing on the most successful performers. A selection of non-winners are tested on the track, including poor performing favourites. Horses are tested out of competition at trainers' premises. This year, out of competition testing has been extended beyond trainers' premises. This means that the IHRB can now inspect and test any thoroughbred anywhere in the country, whether it is in training or not. This is a unique power amongst major racing countries. Testing can now take place at sales, at breeding farms, at point-to-point -point meetings, and at various other sites such as barrier trials and pre-training yards. All adverse findings are dealt with through the IHRB disciplinary process. A detailed equine anti-doping report is now formally presented twice yearly to Horse Racing Ireland. This was published for the first time last week and will be published every six months from now on. Proportionately, Ireland races more horses overseas than any other country. And in 2019, 1,733 Irish trained horses raced in countries as diverse as the United Kingdom, France, Germany, USA, Hong Kong, Australia and Japan and were tested under various international regimes. These international runners represented the equivalent of 6% of the total runners in Ireland and included horses of all standards and ability. No adverse findings were returned. Horse Racing Ireland is committed to working with the IHRB to ensure that their systems are fit for purpose and operate to the best international standards. Our spending on doping control has increased by 27% in the last four years and Horse Racing Ireland has advised the IHRB that funding 
will never be an issue for meaningful initiatives to improve cap capability or increase capacity in this area. So, in summary, Chairman, all winners in Ireland are tested. 25% of testing is out of competition, away from the race course. Out of competition testing now covers all horses at all times, whether in training or not. All samples are analysed at an internationally accredited laboratory. Irish horses are tested regularly in international laboratories when racing overseas. And samples include blood, urine or hair as appropriate. I'm grateful for the opportunity to outline these points. I hope they are helpful and I'd be happy to address any issues or questions which the committee may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Cavanagh. We'll be back to you with questions um, um, later on. I now ask Mr. Egan to make his opening statement on behalf of Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board. Mr. Egan. Um, good morning, uh, Chairman, uh, members of the committee. On behalf of the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board, I want to thank the Chair and members of the Committee on Agriculture, Food and the Marine for their invitation to appear this morning before the Oireachtas Committee. The IHRB was pleased to accept the committee's invitation and the opportunity it provides to address statements in the media which have been made about the integrity and drug usage in Irish racing. We appreciate the fact that the committee chair and members have given time in what is a busy work programme to allow us to set the record straight and we look forward to answering the questions that the de deputies and senators may have. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Dennis Egan. I'm Chief Executive of the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board. I'm joined here today by my colleague, uh, Dr Lynn Hillier, who is Head of Anti-Doping and Chief Veterinary Officer for the IHRB. Lynn, the, Lynn joined the IHRB in 2016, having worked as a regulatory specialist in anti-doping for the British Horse Racing Authority since 2005. She is recognised globally in her field, having published specifically on detection of prohibited substances and is chair of the International Group of Specialist Racing Veterinarians and member of the International Federation of Horse Racing Authorities, which I will refer to as the IFHA. Um, and she's also a member of the IFHA Advisory Council on Prohibited Substances and Practices and of the European Horse Race Scientific Liaison Committee. We are also joined here today by Dr. Clive Pierce, Laboratory Director and Director of Sport and Specialised Analytical Services at LGC, who has been working with us since 2018. As a racing chemist and laboratory director, Clive is active in major international organisations associated with the regulation of animal sports. He is a board member of the EHSLC, a member of the International Equestrian Federation Laboratory and Prohibited List Group and the IFHA Reference Laboratory Technical Committee and their Advisory Council on Prohibited Substances and Practices. LGC is the laboratory that analyzes all our equine samples and is one of only five laboratories in the world certified by the IFHA to analyze racing samples to a benchmark which exceeds accreditation. My colleague Niall Cronin, IHRB communications manager, is also in attendance. Some background information on the IHRB. The Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board, company limited by guarantee, is a company set up by the Turf Club and the Irish National Hunt Steeplechase Committee to carry out the functions assigned to the racing regulatory body under the Horse Racing Ireland Act 2016. It is responsible for the integrity of Irish racing, including doping control and forensics. It carries out its functions through a team of highly trained professional racing officials and administrative staff, as well as dedicated and experienced voluntary race day stewards and committee members. In 2016, the Irish racing and breeding industries came together on a single issue, tackling doping in the wake of the John Hughes case, which had been prosecuted in the courts. The subsequent recommendations of a task force comprising industry representatives, which were reiterated in an updated policy document in 2018, are the foundation for our work today. The appointment of Dr Hillier as head of anti-doping, an established expert in her field, a public procurement process to appoint one of the best laboratories in the world and a seismic shift in increasing out-of-competition testing were all early tangible outputs from those industry agreements. The IHRB's equine anti-doping programme has developed into a sophisticated and extensive risk-based and intelligent-led strategy in which it is not just the numbers of samples which matter, but from what horse they are taken, where and when. 
Regarding the where and when, in addition to the authority the IHRB have under the rules of racing in relation to licensed people and premises, 12 IHRB officials, including five qualified veterinary surgeons, were appointed as authorised officers under the Animal Remedies Act on the 21st of May this year. These officials can identify and sample any thoroughbred at any time and in any place, along with the authority to seize products, documentation or other evidence as necessary. The ability to do this is groundbreaking and part of our armoury in protecting the integrity of Irish racing, which no other racing authority has. Just briefly outline what we do and how we do it in the anti-doping front. The IHRB sample horses both on and off the race course, taking blood, urine and our hair. Using these, these different samples allows us to detect a range of thousands of substances for varying lengths of time. Taking the right type of sample from the right horse at the right time is an essential part of any modern anti-doping programme's test distribution. The IHRB continually refine this, for example, now taking more out-of-competition samples than ever. We are the first racing authority to take hair routinely on the race course. All sampling is witnessed by a representative of the person responsible for the horse, split into an A and B portion, anonymized and sealed in a tamper-proof bottle. The process is automated using an app-based system which ensures integrity, real-time data transfer and minimizes the risk of human error. This process is similar to those used in all sports bodies, whether for human or animal athletes. As Brian said, I would like to stress that all samples are analyzed with screening results usually reported to the IHRB within seven working days. All adverse analytical findings for prohibited substances are prosecuted via disciplinary procedure and the trainer has the right of appeal against any penalty. LGC Laboratories in Newmarket have been the contracted laboratory for the IHRB samples since 2018. Established in 1963, LGC have a long history as world leaders in the development and application of cutting edge approaches to detect existing and emerging drugs from anabolic steroids in the early 60s through to more complex biological threats and gene doping now in 2021. In a typical year, LGC carry out analysis on over 50,000 equine and canine samples and have an ongoing commitment to investing in new technology with contractual requirements to share with the IHRB the outputs of new methods of testing and research as well. LGC is one of the five IH, IFHA certified laboratories, enabling the IHRB to continually benefit from data and intelligence shared between the best racing laboratories in the world. An, expense, an extensive programme of ongoing technical work to evidence performance is required to maintain this certification. LGC's reputation in anabolic steroid and hair analysis is recognised globally. And in LGC, the IHRB has access to the most pioneering laboratory in the world in these two areas, as well as meeting the highest standards along with the other laboratories in relation to analysis of samples for other prohibited substances. In carrying out our anti-doping testing programme, the IHRB applies a risk-based and intelligent-based strategy to our selection of premises and horses for testing. In the first six months since the start of the year, the IHRB have inspected 33 premises testing at 18 of these, seven of which were unlicensed. The unlicensed yards included studs, pre-training yards, sales consignors premises, and also we tested at the recent barrier trials. Prior to the appointment of the 12 IHRB officials as authorised officers, it would not have been possible to access and test at unlicensed premises. In conclusion, the IHRB now has, the un has unique anti-doping powers that are unparalleled in any other jurisdiction. The appointment of IHRB officials as authorised officers is a game changer, as it enables those officials to access any thoroughbred in any time at any place without notice. We continue to work with LGC, one of the leading laboratories in the world, who are pioneers in the analysis of hair samples. We have a top-class anti-doping team headed up by Dr. Lynn Hillier, and whilst we continue to evidence that there is no systematic attempt to cheat through doping in Irish racing, we will continue with the assistance of the industry and those outside to effectively detect, disrupt and deter such behaviour. It will not be tolerated. We will continue to seek it out and where discovered, we will take all actions within our power to combat it without fear or favour. Thank you, Mr Chairman and Committee members.
Thank you, Mr. Egan. I now invite questions from the members and Senator Daly. Uh, and I'd like to, to welcome our witnesses here this morning, Mr. Cavanagh, Mr. Egan, Dr. Hillier, Mr. Crowland, and Mr. Pierce, and thank the, both uh, groupings for their, their presentation. <clears throat> I suppose at the outset, Chair, while it might be well known, I, I probably obliged to put on the record that I have skin in the game. I'm a member of AIRO, the Association of Irish Race Horse Owners, a member of the Irish Turbo Breeders Association. I have a brood mare and the first of her progeny is commencing a racing career out of Pat Martin's yard. So I have skin in the game in that regard, but I also have a dedication and, and, and a personal passion for, for, for the business, the industry and the sport by virtue of the fact that I have been the voluntary chairman of, of Quebecan Racecourse for over a decade. So look, just putting all that on the record, I, I have interest in the, in the industry and in the sport and a passion for it. Um, I suppose I, that was uh, struck a chord with me as a young man, I suppose back in the day, when I would have a newspaper, I would have read the sports section and, and my reading would have ended there until I suppose, later in life. Now, my political involvement and a keener interest in uh, public affairs, I started the front of the paper and would finish before I would have got to the sports section. But mm. I will say reservedly, unfortunately, three of the last four Sundays, I found myself starting at the back of the paper and I think what I was reading has not been good for the industry and for 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 the the, the sport that, as I said already, I've I've I have passion for. Like the old justice motto of innocent until proven guilty is actually read in reverse when you're in a public domain, when you're a public body, when you're representing, uh, spending public money a public representative or involved in an organisation that is of public interest. And unfortunately, in that situation, it has to be read as guilty until proven innocent. And once there's accusations or assertions made, you're then duty bound, I suppose, almost to prove your own innocence. So in that regard, I would have some questions for the industry. Mr. Kavna and Mr. Egan will probably know who, who's best is suited to answer them. And they were probably along the lines of what actions you have taken since this scenario started and what further actions you intend taking to, as I probably bluntly say, to prove your own innocence, because in the public eye, you are guilty once the accusation is made. And I say that with the, the greatest regard. I'm not making any accusations myself. I would like to know from the industry side, um, and as I say, whichever body thinks it's, it, it, it's most appropriate to them, why we're here today with the best interest of, of, of everybody at heart and to get to the bottom of the situation and has been outlined by the chairman, we're not a, a court of justice. Did you consider, would you consider, have ye or will ye hold your own inquiry in, in, into any of the allegations that have been made? You know, I think as, as licensing bodies, the, all people um, out there who are in the industry um, either have a permit or a license which would be uh, overseen or issued by one or other of yourselves. And did you, would you not think it would be appropriate that maybe this hearing or inquiry should have been or could be or maybe still will be hopefully held in, in by yourselves to get to the bottom of, of some of or many of the allegations and look put them to bed, solve them or if they're if if if, if they're false, maybe take some action on, on, on those who, who are uh, making them. Um, with regard to the IHRB and in particular on the, the third article of the Sunday Independent, um, there, there was some coverage on some anonymous letters and correspondence you would have received as kind of uh, anonymous whistleblowing correspondence, I suppose I'd put it, and a very, very strong uh, allegations that they, they, they were not acted on. I, I would, I'd like to hear you comment on them, and do you have a a file of, of, of complaints which, um, as has been said, 
have to be acted on. I, I, I think you deserve the, the, the right to explain that one a little bit further. Uh, Dr. Hillier, I, I have some, and, and Mr. Pierce, I have some, I have some questions on the testing sides. And just for yourself, Dr. Hillier, when in preparation, when 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 you do a bit of googling, there are a number of articles that come up which which you contributed to yourself, and one which struck me, you know, not long after your appointment, uh, bore the headline of mucking out the turf club stables. I'd like to give you the opportunity to explain that a little bit more. Like, what what did you what were you saying you were going to muck out there? You know, it, it it's it reads badly. I think that headline now it may not have at the time. Um, with regard to the number of tests that are being carried out, and as I said at the outset, the, while it's 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 an impressive number. We are where we are now, and 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 there needs to be changes. To, to, as I say, going back to prove the innocence of, of the associations and, and the industry. The 2,449, I think it is, just shy of 2,500 tests which have been carried out, let them be on race courses or in private uh, uh, properties. Is there a record, uh, an available record of the results of, of all those tests? Um, on file in IHRB, can they be accessed by somebody through freedom of information, or, or are they um, always forwarded to the the people responsible for the horse post-testing? Do they, do they get a copy, irrespective of whether it's an adverse analytical finding or, or not? Um, I, I would just like to know, is there a record of all those uh, samples taken having been actually tested? And in that regard, I, I'd like also, a little bit more clarification on in, in your submission, you say, um, I think it's in particular when referencing winners on track, that blood, urine and or hair samples are taken. So you take both blood and urine and on occasions hair also. In that situation where you would take blood and urine, are both the blood and urine tested? And again, when hair is taken, um, is, is the hair, are all three samples tested? And I would like a little bit more discussion or explanation from, from Dr. Hillier, Mr. Pierce, the experts, I suppose, on the whole hair issue. Hair testing seems to come up for, for discussion and debate in when we're when we're discussing this 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 issue a lot. It seems to be the better of the of the three uh, samples for testing and seems to give a more historical um, reading of what substances may have, have been um, administered. Farther back or previously in in the in the horse's career, I know I know um, I think even in humans you hear of where where somebody will test clear if you do a hair sample it will go back if they have a, even a history of, of taking substances and I, I I assume it's the same with, with within within the the, the uh, horses so you know why I would also then ask on that. While, while the numbers that you're portraying here, that you're testing, are good and, and, and are impressive, maybe less is more. If we were doing less and concentrating more on air, I'd like to hear your comments on that. Would we maybe be, be coming up with better results? Because, like, based on the accusations, for want of a better word, to have 10 adverse analytical <coughs> findings, all of which were not of substances that, that that are fully banned, you know, would 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 portray the image that, that that things are rosy in the garden. But unfortunately, as I say, we have to prove that they are at the, at this juncture. I mean, in that regard, maybe Mr. Pierce would would comment a little bit more on the actual testing. Is it the same? Are the same substances uh, tested for? In the Irish samples, as would be in the the BHA, the, the, the British samples, because I know the laboratory does both uh, Irish and and UK racing. Are, are, is his brief to test or or look for the same substances in both um, jurisdictions, or do we have a different uh, test? And maybe he would also maybe enlighten us a little bit more on how the drug developers can stay or how they seem to be able to stay ahead of the test you know how 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 quickly and how 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 adequately are the the, the powers that are on the other side of the fence developing new drugs that maybe we're not even testing for and he may also comment on or might also comment himself or dr hilger might comment on the recent uh uh, food issue, which was detected in France but didn't come up in any of the Irish tests. 
you know, if you could explain that, is, is I suppose what I'm coming at is, are the French and English tests more severe than ours? Is, is there, could there be an issue with our tests? Um, I think I've covered a lot there, Chair, and, and, and I give the, the, the witnesses the opportunity to come back. And if there's time at the end, I may come back in if you have time. Thanks very much, Chair. OK, uh, Senator Daly, a very comprehensive list of questions. Which of the witnesses wants to, wants to take that those first, please? Um, Chairman, if it's in order, I'll um, start, if that's OK. OK, Mr Egan. Thank you very much. Um, I suppose I want to reiterate at the outset that the IHRB was pleased to accept the committee's invitation and the opportunity to address statements in the media which uh, Senator Daly has referred to, um, which have been made about integrity and drug use in Ireland. Um, I have to say we're very frustrated and disappointed by the recent allegations and in our responses today um, we will set out the factual details uh, of, uh, to set the record straight. And I suppose just one point before I hand over to my colleague Dr Lynn Hillier, and that is just in relation to any information we get, um, the information is uh, assessed and acted upon. So that's the first thing I, I just want to say. But I'll hand over to Dr Hillier because there's quite a lot of, of technical issues uh, in there, uh, which Dr Hillier, and I'm sure she'll pass over to Dr Pierce, um, will be better able to answer than myself. Lynn. Okay, Dr Hillier. Apologies, I was being very good and staying on mute. Chairman, committee, I would like to echo Mr. Kavanagh and Mr. Egan's thanks for being here today and to have the opportunity to somewhat set the record straight. Um, as a veterinary surgeon and a scientist, when the truth is not reported correctly, it grates. And I'm hoping that this morning we can set some of those facts straight, clarify matters, explain matters. That's what we're here to do. Before I get into some of the questions, which were, which were detailed and extensive, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to working through them. I would just like to echo the, the, the three points that Mr. Egan made. Every sample that we take is analysed. Every single sample is analysed at LGC, with the exception of the B samples, which are analysed at LCH in France. Every finding is followed up unequivocally every single finding, and I suppose that goes some way to answering whether there is a, a database or a record of all the results. Yes, there is. Um, it's very much sitting there on, on our systems. Um, the third point I'd like to make, there's been a lot of chatter and talk of our laboratory, our contracted laboratory, being somehow substandard. That is not the case. We work with one of the best laboratories in the world. I've worked with them for some time. There's a history and a trust there, which is very important when you're working in partnership with experts. Um, they won the contract for our work back in 2018 through a public procurement process. They are leading in the world, but I'll, I'll let Dr. Pierce speak, speak to that. Um, looking at the, the, the questions themselves, um, I suppose I'll start with one of the ones that was directly for, for me to answer, the mucking out, the sables, that headline. I don't write the headlines. I was asked to do the interview and in the interests of transparency and again, talking about my, my favourite subject in the world, which is anti-doping, um, I accepted the, the invitation for the interview. Um, I was brought in, just going back a little bit, I was brought in as a new position, head of anti-doping and chief veterinary officer, as has been set out according to the recommendations of an independent anti-doping task force. I say independent because it was comprised of stakeholders, it had a lot of different views. Um, it wasn't the turf club as it was then. In 2018, those recommendations were reinforced again by the industry. The industry signed up to wanting this to be done. I was brought in in 2016 and we immediately began to make changes. So just in, in no particular order, it was very clear to me that the out of competition testing needed to increase in line with best international practice. So we moved from 7% in 2016 to 18% in 2019, and we're now sitting at somewhere around 28%. That is best international practice. practice. These animals spend the majority of their time at home. It's really important we have coverage in that area. And I will just mention at this point that access now that we have since the 21st of May means that my team can literally go to any thoroughbred in the island. That is unparalleled. I have a team out this morning doing exactly that, doing what they're meant to be doing. So 
I think the mucking out the headline was, was, was not something I would have chosen. Um, I have huge respect for what's gone before. But we have moved things on, absolutely no doubt. And I suppose one of the biggest evidences of that was in 2018, when the IHRB was formed, as distinct from the Turf Club and the INHSC. Um, the results of all the tests we do um, are logged, catalogued, documented to an inch of their lives. They have to be, that's our process. There is a, um, a, a what's the word I'm looking for, continuous chain of custody from the moment that the sample is taken horse side and witnessed by the representative of the trainer or the person responsible through to when it is received anonymously at the laboratory analyzed and reported so from the moment it is taken it's a number it's not a name it's not a horse it's not a person it's a number and it has to remain that way in order that any decisions that are made along the way in terms of i don't know further analysis whatever might need to be done are made absolutely anonymously um, in terms of reporting yes all results are reported the vast majority of them are negative um, the positives or the adverse analytical findings to use the, the full term are always reported we've had instances where a drug can be detected in part it's a it's a so-called screening finding it's part of the fingerprint but it doesn't confirm to a full result those are also reported back Dr. Hill, we have lost you for some reason. We've lost sound for some reason. Dr. Doctor, Dr. 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 Can you just speak again there, Dr. Hill, we see his sound back? Sorry? Could you mute and unmute um, again, Dr. Hillier, please? No, um, we've lost you there, unfortunately. Um, we, we'll move to Dr. Pierce, and we can come back to you de again, Dr. Hillier. Sorry about that. Now I don't know what gremlins are at work there, but sorry about that. Mr. Mr. Uh, Dr. Pierce, um, have you comments to pass there on, 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 on Senator Daly's questions? Mr. Pierce. Are we in trouble, Hubert? Can any of the members speak so we can see the dark side? Pardon? Can any of the members say something so we can check the dark side? Sorry, sorry, Mr. Pierce, we can't hear we can't we can't hear you either. Um, could Deputy Q or Deputy Carty um, talk there? See, can we hear can we hear ye, Paul? Matt. No, we have a problem. We we're not hearing anyone here. Sorry, we'll we'll um, we'll I suspend for a few minutes, Hubert. Um, I'm going to have to suspend for a couple of minutes until we sort out this um, communications problem. So I'll suspend the meeting for five minutes. Um, and my my sincerest apologies for this, but it's outside my control. So we'll suspend for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, in Sorry, terms of the question about, am I, am I good now? Will I yeah, continue? You are. Yeah, yeah, my apologies okay. for that, but I don't know what happened there. Sorry Not about that. <laughs> I was on mute to begin with. Um, in terms of blood, hair, and urine, urine would be the traditional matrix or substance or, or part of the body that we would take to analyze. The reason for that, and Dr. Pierce may explain more, is that we get a, a, a really good window on what is happening with the horse. Blood is a much um, uh, shorter window of time that it can represent. Each of those matrices have their strengths and weaknesses. Some substances will show better in blood and some will show better in urine. Hair, we started administering 
um, substances to experimental horses and researching on hair some 15 years ago. So hair has been a research tool for some 15, 20 years in horses. Um, and you were absolutely right. It's, it's, it's very much used in people. We have the advantage with the horses that there's an awful lot more hair. We have mane hair, we have tail hair, which can, can go back for years. So it was clearly going to be an exciting opportunity to be able to better understand how long we can detect substances, drugs in, 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 in our horses. So as I say, the work goes back some 15 years. Operationally, we've been using hair here in Ireland since 2018. I've been using it across the water before then. I think what I'd like to say about hair is that it's, and I'm going to let Dr. Pierce, it's important Dr. Pierce really goes, 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 goes back, comes back to you on, on, on this because he is, he is the expert in the piece. But from an operational regulatory point of view, hair gives us a longer window of time. It gives us more confidence in the blood and the urine results that we find to give us more of an understanding of how long that drug has been in the horse or how long the horse has been exposed to it. It also allows us to take samples in a non-invasive way. So taking a blood sample has to be done by a veterinary surgeon. Taking a hair sample or a urine sample can be done by a non-vet, which makes it more applicable across a wider, a wider field in terms of our strategy. So the straight answer to your question, blood, hair or urine, which is better, they're all good in their own way. And the best way to use them is together in a complementary fashion and to be really careful about when you use which one. We've used all three successfully to prosecute cases or to see cases through to a proper conclusion. Um, and in every case, the hair has added value, the blood has added value, the urine has added value. We, in, in the ideal world of unlimitless resources and time, we would take blood, hair and urine from every horse. What we have to do is strategically use the three together. So on a race course, typically, we would take blood and urine for a period of time as a period of target testing. And if we wanted to follow up on a case, we would take a mixture of the, res of, of the matrices. So I hope that answers that question, but I'll leave that to Dr. Pierce to go into more detail. The only other thing I wanted to comment on was, was the less is more. Um, I'm a great believer in less is more. Um, it's quality, not quantity. What I will say is that we're very, very keen that we try and do both in our anti-doping strategy. So not only have we increased the numbers, and, and yes, the numbers for June are, are significant. Um, we had to slightly balance out a, an absence of activity earlier in the year due to the pandemic. We had to just be cognizant of the landscape within which we were working. But we've made up for that, I think, in June by taking advantage as well of our authorised officer status from the 21st of May. But it's the it, it's not just the numbers. It's, it's what you're testing for and how you're testing it. That means that you have to rely on the expertise of your laboratory. So I think without further ado, um, Chairman, if it's okay, I'll pass across to Dr. Pierce and allow him to fill you in on some of the technical laboratory side. Okay, Mr. Pierce. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Hillier. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, Dr. Pierce, yeah. Okay, fine. Um, well, as I said, thank you for the opportunity to explain uh, a little more about how the LGC laboratory has support the IHRB. And as has been said by others, we have uh, been in that role of support since 2018. And we work according to an operational document. Uh, and this operational document is reviewed and updated on a quarterly basis uh, at the business meetings that we have with the IHRB. And as uh, others have said, um, uh, LGC is a world leading racing chemistry lab. And it has uh, extensive animal sports testing and research and development programs uh, that have been developed over, over many years. We're well known for our pioneering research and continued investment in detecting the use of banned substances, such as anabolic steroids, which has uh, been a specialism of ours over many, many years. Uh, EPO, so the, the large biological molecules, uh, now feature strongly. And again, as Dr. Gillier has said, we have uh, introduced many novel testing methods, including uh, including hair testing. But just to pick up on, uh, on some of the points there around uh, uh, hair testing, um, it is a very useful matrix uh, to do analysis uh, on because it does have uh, a long a long window of detection. Uh, typically in blood, you're talking a matter of days, sometimes a week. Uh, with urine, uh, it's a little bit longer generally. And urine has the advantage that uh, 
um, drugs and metabolites tend to concentrate in the urine, so uh, you see more to be seen in the urine. With hair, though you have the long window of opportunity really to uh, detect, uh, the concentrations that you find of drugs uh, in the hair generally very, very low because it relies on the drug circulating in the animal system and then being incurred in the head. So the, the, the advantage, there is a big advantage in terms of the uh, window detection, but concentrations are very, very small. So that's, it's only really been in recent years when uh, the analytical technology has advanced to the point where we can detect such very, very low concentration. But hair testing has, uh, has come in really as a, as a useful um, addition to uh, urine and blood testing. But as Dr. Hillier has said, urine and blood, because the concentrations are higher generally and because it, it's uh, a very convenient, uh, much more convenient matrix to, uh, to, to test or to take and to test. Uh, I think uh, it'll be some time before um, hair testing really um, uh, comes along completely on side with, uh, with, uh, with urine and blood testing. So urine and blood testing will, I think, always be, um, or for the foreseeable future, will, will be the main matrices supported by hair. Um, so, what I want to emphasise is the huge amount of international collaboration that goes on uh, around research and development programmes. LGC, part of uh, the Association of Official Racing Chemists, and as uh, Dr. Hillier has said, part of the uh, European Horse Race Scientific Liaison Committee. Um, we also have representation on the IFHA's Advisory Council and uh, the RMT uh, CES, uh, an organization in America, the Scientific Advisory Committee. So uh, the laboratory is well placed in terms of the, its interaction and collaboration with uh, racing interests uh, right around the world. So let me just pick up on. Uh, couple of questions that uh, were, were, were raised. Firstly, around the uh, zilpaterol. I think this was the uh, this was at the heart of the, the question that was raised about LGC's detection capability versus uh, that of uh, LCH. And please remember that uh, LGC, along with LCH, are two of the five IFHA reference laboratories. So we are seen very much in the vanguard of uh, racing laboratories. We are at the top of the tree, as it were. But uh, it has to be remembered that uh, what we are detecting, both laboratories, what both laboratories are detecting, uh, is are upwards to close to 3,000 different substances. So a huge array of different uh, um, chemical molecules are being detected, both as uh, drugs themselves and, and metabolites. Now, many of those are, are medications or uh, known contaminants, uh, and these and naturally occurring contaminants, and these have associated with them reporting that screening limits or international thresholds. So there is a, a number of those 3,000 uh, where we have definite concentrations that all laboratories work through. However, uh, the vast majority uh, don't have such concentrations. So it's up to each laboratory to cover those uh, two and a half, 3,000 molecules uh, as best we can uh, and as sensitively as we can. Now, in the case of zilpaterol, which is the uh, where the interest uh, uh, lay last year, zilpaterol is a uh, is is a feed contaminant, a known feed contaminant, but not in Europe. It hadn't been hadn't really been raised as an issue in Europe prior to 2020. It was the first time that uh, zilpaterol had been detected by a laboratory in uh, as as a feed contaminant in in Europe. And zilpaterol is a banned at all time. And as I've said, laboratories are encouraged to report uh, uh, um, 
at as low a concentration as possible for such substances. And medication and doping control labs are required to detect many hundreds of such prohibited substances. So every lab uses a range of what we call multi-residue methods. And there is potential within those uh, methods to focus sensitivity uh, on particular areas, but on particular drugs, but there's usually trade-offs. So a lab has to work uh, conscious of the fact that it's trying to cover as many substances as it possibly can with its multi-residue methods. It simply can't set up methods to detect um, 3,000 separate compounds. It has to bolt them together in multi-residue methods. So prior to uh, the uh, to 2020, LGC's routine methods were capable of detecting zolpaprobol for typically two to three weeks in urine. That's, that's how the method was set up. When uh, LGC, uh, sorry, when, when, when LGC was, was made aware of uh, LCH's uh, um, findings, uh, we very quickly uh, assessed, um, in collaboration with uh, LCH, our detection capabilities. And we discovered that uh, although we were detecting at about uh, a part per billion, which is a very low concentration, but say giving coverage for three to three and a half weeks typically, we found that LCH uh, had their method set up uh, at around about five times the greater sensitivity. But as soon as we were made aware of that uh, issue, we, uh, we took it on board uh, and adjusted our method uh, so that uh, we could at least be as sensitive as LCH. And we, would, we did that within 48 hours. And at the same time, there was a, a huge amount of international interest uh, as a result. And uh, it was discussed in the advisory council of the uh, IFHA and within the EHSLC and internationally uh, within a matter of weeks, uh, agreed reporting levels were, uh, were decided for zilpaprobol in both urine and blood. And uh, LGC, LCH uh, and the other European labs and other labs around the world are now operating to those reporting levels. So that's a good example in many ways of how communication and collaboration amongst uh, regulators and the testing laboratories can uh, adjust to a, uh, an incident uh, or a threat. And, and that's exactly what we do. And you know, it, all the time through the, these various racing and analytical bodies that we're involved with, we're picking up intelligence, we're acting on it and we're adjusting and refining our methodologies so that uh, we counter the, uh, the incidents and the, and, the, and the new threats to the integrity of racing and, and the safety of uh, animal competitors. So that, that's how it all works. It works through communication and uh, LGC is one of the world's major racing laboratories is right at the heart of uh, so much of uh, of that communication and collaboration, both in terms of our testing programmes and our extensive research programmes. Okay, okay, Mr. Pierce, I, I, you'll have an opportunity to get in again. I, I have a whole um, lot of members wishing wishing to um, ask questions, and I have given um, the witnesses. Uh, 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 um, a great latitude this morning to outline our work because I felt it was important that we got a, a very a, a very comprehensive background to the testing that is going on. But um, as I said, um, I have a, a lot of members who want to ask questions, so I'm going to move on to some of the members and we'll go back to the witnesses then. Deputy Carty. And again, thanks to our guests and just to put on the record um, as well, my own esteem um, um, for the success of Irish horse racing and to reiterate Senator Daly's comments that the objective of this committee is to ensure that the international reputation for which we were renowned um, is protected and enhanced at all um, stages. I have a number of questions. I'll go back and forth, if that's all right, um, Cahirlock, um, and I'll just um, direct these initially to Mr Egan. You concluded your opening remarks by essentially saying that there is no systemic cheating 
within the horse racing industry. And I think it's important that we state clearly that this committee has no evidence um, whatsoever that there, there is. And my question is, do you think uh, or, or, or do you b believe there is any cheating at all? Mr. Egan. Mm -hmm. um, if we could hand over to Dr. Hillier, who's at the cold face to deal with that question. Please. Okay. I'll be very ha happy to, to take that. Um, cheating takes many forms. Cheating in any sport takes many forms. Um, to me, somebody who would try to gain an advantage by using a medication inappropriately would be cheating as much as somebody who would use perhaps a more traditional performance enhancing type drug such as EPO. So I suppose that's the first thing to say is that we might well, that both. in relation to the former then, do you believe that is happening? I. I believe that by the fact we have an extensive modern anti-doping programme in place, by the fact that we are detecting, deterring and disrupting the behaviour, I think that we are on top of it. Is there cheating? I think people will always try to go close to the edge in any sport, and I think that that is true. We've had cases, you'll, you'll, you'll no doubt know in the last three years, we've had cases, we've had four cases of anabolic steroids being found, for example, just to pick a drug that most people would associate with cheating. Of those four, two of them were completely and utterly natural and normal for the animals concerned. So I think it's really important to understand that it's the, it's the nature of the drug, it's why it's there, that's just as important as, as the type of drug. And I, just one thing on that, one thing that I was passionate about when I came in alongside um, another new position, Head of Legal Licensing and, and Compliance, was to make sure that we put in an investigative structure for every single case. Every single analytical finding gets investigated because it's one thing to say there's a drug there, it's another thing to understand why. And just to give one, I, I'm not really a figures person, but I think sometimes it's important to just yeah, give can I just a say, couple that of was figures. My quick question, um, yeah. so um, you, can I just um, go back a, a little bit? Um, you mentioned earlier on that blood and urine tests are um, routinely taken from um, winners. Is that actually the case that both blood and urine samples would be taken? My understanding is that urine samples primarily would be taken and that blood samples would generally only be taken where urine wasn't passed. No, we, we take both, not, not in every case. We can take both in every case. We, you're absolutely right. We would more usually take urine because it gives what a broader percentage, coverage. What percentage would you be talking about where only urine tests would be taken? You'd be talking something both. in the region of between 80 and 90 per cent in a typical, a typical month. You'd be taking both? No, I've, I've taken purely urine. But if you go back okay, to what so, I was so saying... No, that's, just, that's an important clarification. So routinely urine tests are taken. And on the race course, percent. hang on. Percent. So, yeah, okay, so. I, I, I need to just explain that the, the, the urine is part of the picture. When we take out of competition sampling, it's typically the other way around. It's blood with hair in addition. So what I wanted to try to explain, as I went, went through earlier, these matrices are all important. There's not, not one that's better than the other. They do the job according to what you're trying to detect on the day. So on race day, it's really important that we have a very deep, extensive coverage of what's present. When we're taking samples in out of competition, because they're unannounced, because people don't know we're coming, if you like, the blood sampling together with the hair is the right combination generally. Generally. I know, and m m my apologies. Unfortunately, COVID rules mean that we have two hours for this meeting, and one of those hours is almost up. So I'm going to um, ask, if at all possible, um, for um, sharper responses. I want to just go back to m Mr. Egan. Just in relation to your board and the structure of IHRB, I think it would be useful if you could briefly describe um, the makeup of it. Yeah, there's six members uh, on the board of the IHRB, three direct, six directors rather, um, three are nominees of the Turf Club and three are nominees of the Irish uh, National Hunt Steeplechase Committee. Um, we, the chairman of the board at the moment is Mr Harry McCalmont and uh, the vice chairman is Martin O'Donnell. Um, the board meets 10 to 10 times or so per annum, and they're heavily involved in, in policy, but they are not involved in the day-to-day -day operations as such of the IHRB. That is uh, a matter for the executives. 
but they are the, the, the governing authority. No, I'm just the reason I ask is because I note that in America, the US anti-doping agency is to put in place a new governing body that will be made up of nine members, five of whom will be completely independent of the industry. Four will be experts of the intra, um, of the industry with no but no active and um, current in, engagement. Um, do you see the merit of that type of a structure where there is a clear differential between the the industry and the sector and the governing body? Um, well, we are. Uh, there's plenty of our directors are not involved in the industry as such. Some of them are, but the situation in the USA is completely different than it is in Ireland. Um, there's. 38 odd racing commissions, it's completely different. The, our board sets policy on, on drug testing. Our policy is based on what's happening internationally. So if a horse comes to run in Ireland, uh, effectively the sample is tested in a, one of the five IHA certified laboratories, which is LGC. Similarly, if a horse runs in Hong Kong, it's tested by the Hong Kong laboratory. So there's uniformity in drug testing and policy in drug testing is, is similar across all the main racing jurisdictions. Yeah, and um, one of the areas of interest and um, a little bit of confusion is the distinction where the HRI ends and the IHRB um, starts. And you know that some of the questions are often put to two bodies because there's confusion as to who exactly is um, responsible. And um, so to get a sense of, of, of the relationship, was there any interaction between the HRI and the IHRB before this morning's meeting? Uh, we work regularly with uh, the IH or HRI on many matters, budgeting uh, and everything else. I suppose if I could outline maybe the very short, very quickly, because I know we're, we're uh, tight on time. Um, as Brian said earlier on, the IHRB is solely and independently responsible for making and enforcing the rules of racing. We're responsible for employing racing officials. We're responsible for, responsible for uh, doping control and forensics. Uh, we're responsible for representing Ireland internationally in respect of our functions and um, I just can't remember the fifth one, but that's all set out in the Horse Racing Ireland Act 2016. We interact regularly with Horse Racing Ireland. Uh, as Brian said, we, we meet them on a quarterly basis to go through um, our, our budgets uh, and our accounts because obviously we uh, Horse Racing Ireland provide our funding and it's important that our funding is spent uh, in accordance with the, with the budget that we submit. Uh, if we see something coming down the line which has financial implications, which is not budgeted, we, we liaise with Horse Racing Ireland. But I'd say we're on to Horse Racing Ireland uh, at least two or three times a week on, on um, budgetary matters or, or um, integrity related matters. And I want to say as well that in this whole anti-doping area, Horse Racing Ireland have been a great support. As Brian said, uh, we're pushing an open door uh, on anti-doping in relation to funding and everything else. And that's something we welcome. Um, but did you meet um, to discuss this morning's hearing? Uh, we had discussions, uh, just very high level discussions, but they, Horse Racing Ireland did their thing, we did our thing, because obviously both of us were coming in this morning. Just, just, just uh, perhaps uh, Deputy Carty, I step in there. Mm. Uh, we operate under a service level agreement in relation to integrity mm. services each year. That cascades down to an annual budget, which is approved by the Board of Horse Racing Ireland. And then, as Dennis says, a quarterly review meeting at executive level. But aside from that, there's day-to-day -day contact uh, to do with racing. The, the functions are set out in, in, in legislation. They're separate, but they impact heavily on each other. Mm. And we would we would talk to each other daily, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. And certainly, in the run-up to today, uh, you, you know, we would have been in touch with each other regularly. Okay, so just to, there was reference um, by by both gentlemen there in relation to budget and HRI did give IHRB um, funding towards CCTV. Um, in coverage that hasn't been in ca carried out. I note that as far back as I think 2017, the privacy statement on your on the IHRB website was updated to reflect the installation in multiple t um, stables, but it hasn't yet um, happened. Do you accept, uh, Mr. Egan, that the lack of CCTV allows a situation where doping could potentially happen? Um, I don't think so. Uh, CCTV is just one element, one part of the whole, um, uh, pro pro which would assist. But I want to say, like at the outset, that we welcome HRI's commitment uh, to providing funding for CCTV cameras and stable and stable yards on the Irish race courses, and we're working towards having the cameras in place in all race courses prior to the commencement 
of the uh, 2022 racing season and it will it will of course provide an additional layer of security uh, to our existing measures um, you are right uh, money had been allocated before to cover a small number of race courses um, and uh, it didn't proceed for uh, reasons that the money was allocated elsewhere but um, we would we very much welcome a state-of-the-art CCTV system which which is in the process of, of being it's, it's out for public procurement at the moment and the tenders in the process of being evaluated Perhaps you could describe just um, briefly again, um, when somebody makes a, um, reports concerns about whether it be about a particular individual or establishment that um, outlines in their view how an operation might have happened, whose desk does that land on first in the IHRB and how is that dealt with as such? Uh, sorry, Deputy Carty, just if you could clarify that operation in what context? If, if somebody is if somebody is to make an allegation of an illegal activity um, or a doping um, yeah. allegation, for for example, um, and yeah. the outline, and, and perhaps outlining in great detail, perhaps not, but I just want to know the process as to what happens next in terms of the IHRB. Yeah. Well, what I will, I suppose, it, it depends on who it comes into. But uh, if uh, it could come in via the confidential hotline, or it could come in to me, or it could come in directly to Dr. Hillier. But maybe if I ask Dr. Hillier just to outline uh, how she has dealt with some alleg or, uh, allegations or, or intelligence reports that she would have received, it might give you a better idea of how and we yeah, operate. That, that, would be, that would be useful. Be, I mean, what I want sorry. in the first instance is no, is there a streamlined position, you know, a universal position that this is the person whose desk it lands on and this is how it is then pro processed as opposed to the generic, you know? Well, 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 the procedure is no matter who desks, whose desk it lands on, it gets passed to Dr. Hillier. Okay. So, it, well, if it's in relation to anti-doping, yes. Um, of, of course. No, you're, you're, uh, Mr. Egan is exactly right. The process is very simple. The information, information in broad terms, will come into any one of us, whether it's one of my team on the race course today, whether it's Mr. Egan, whether it's somebody in HRI, whether it's a trainer, stable staff, etc. The information can come in via a number of routes. Once it lands on someone's desk in our organisation, it will actually come into either myself or to the head of legal life in compliance, Dr. Kleena Guy. She actually manages the information hotline, the confidential hotline. Um, and it is dealt with, unequivocally, it's dealt with. Now, I need to be really clear here. Sometimes information can be scribbled on the back of an envelope. Sometimes it can be a recorded, taped conversation. Sometimes I, I'll receive um, envelopes in the post with uh, leaflets of products. I don't care. We don't care how it comes in. The important part is it comes in and it's assessed. And I think w we need to be really careful here that we differentiate between information coming in and hearsay. Um, I'm not saying that we disregard either. We, we consider everything, but we have to process it then and assess it. That's, that's basically converting information into intelligence. We work very closely now with the BHA. They actually manage the database in which the intelligence is logged. Every single piece is logged. That means that when a piece of information that perhaps could come in today that on its own doesn't seem to make much sense, might make sense in two months' time when it's put together with another piece of information. That's how we work. That is modern anti-doping. And I, you mentioned USADA and Travis Tigart. I've had quite a lot of dealings with them in the past. Um, one of the things that they will say repeatedly is that that information coming in, whistleblowing, people who are prepared to step up and give that information is really, really important. Um, I'll give an example, really, of where information coming in, actually from another racing authority, uh, was acted upon back last year. And it's, it's, it links in with something I wanted to come back on in terms of Senator Daly's comment about having to prove our innocence. One of the things that um, rankled the most, if you like, was reading last Sunday's piece about the six horses. The six horses where Irish horses were alleged to have anabolic steroids on board, and we're, you know, we were just doing nothing about it. It's the absolute opposite. The minute that information came into the BHA, they acted on it. They communicated with us. We were across it and we were prepared to act. They did the most extensive piece of work I think I've ever seen, actually, apart from outside a, a, an investigation of an adverse finding, to go into that with an inch of its life. They analysed tail hair, they analysed mane hair, they analysed samples repeatedly at LGC Laboratory, and I won't go into again where LGC stand in the world of, of hair chemistry and anabolic serochemistry, and there was nothing. Now, this is no criticism of the other laboratory involved, but this is expert stuff. 
LGC have been looking at anabolic steroid profiles since 1963. They know the difference between the normal profile of a cult compared with an animal that's been administered an anabolic steroid. They've done it for us in investigations. They've done it numerous times in investigations. They've dealt with live samples. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that, that staying ahead of that, being on top of that, dealing with that information in a timely fashion is critical. Because if that had returned a positive result, we'd have been in those yards immediately on unannounced visits. Actually, we would, we, it wouldn't have just been us, it would have been us in conjunction with the department. Anything like that, we act with our colleagues in the investigations division of the department. Okay, um, thanks. I don't know what's happening with my screen. I don't know if it's the same with everybody. Hopefully we're still live. Yeah. Yeah, um, okay, I can see Matt, you. Yeah. I can see you. Is the chairman there? Yes, Matt, you're fine, yeah. Okay, yeah, no, that, that, that's, no, that's fine. Um, fine. Just in terms of, um, so I suppose to take the very high profile case, that of um, Viking Horde of October 2018, where um, you know, it was found that there was a dangerous level of sedative um, there, what steps were taken to actually identify who was actually responsible for that? So as in any anti-doping case, it's investigated as thoroughly as we possibly can. So I work with my colleagues in the security division to interview and assess the information. My part, as you'd expect, is, is, is more limited to the horse side, the, the drug side, the, the chemistry side. I, in that particular case, I assessed the amount of ACP present in the horse in the sample against research data to give us an idea of the window of time within which we believed it would have been exposed or administered the, the, the drug and so on and so forth. See, CCTV clearly wasn't in place, and I'm not going to go back over that ground again. What I can, what I will say on CCTV, having been involved for 15 odd years across the water in anti-doping yeah, no, investigation. Again, again, again I, 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 But it wouldn't I, have made a difference in terms of- interesting, but- Okay. Yeah, but so I just, anyway. do you think it's acceptable that, you know, something so, you know, damaging to the, the sector um, and you know this issue was exposed in October um, 2018. That we don't know the culprit, and it's possible that the culprit is still active in horse racing. I think I think the important bit is, is that it was detected, it was disrupted, and it was stopped, and it was brought to book. One thing I was going to say earlier, actually, the statistic I was going to say before before we stopped, we've had 60 cases in the last since 2018. In 50, 55 of those, we have been very sure of the source of the drug. That is a percentage which exceeds that in most racing authorities. So, you know, at the end of the day, I would love to identify the, 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 the categoric source in every single case. That's just not possible. We'll do what we can, and we won't stop until we've done everything we can. As I say, 55 of 60 cases, we are very clear we know what's happened. Viking Horde was one of the ones where we have to hold our hands up. We didn't, we didn't get to the end of the line. I, I, that's it. Okay, here, look, I'm about a quarter way through my questions, but um, just a deference to the other members, um, I'll wave and ask for you if there is any additional time at the end of the meeting. You might let me back in, please. Yeah, well, thanks we're, we're, again. We're, we're going to have a we're going to have a problem today, um, Deputy Carty. We're definitely not going to get to the end of it, the end of the questions. And um, I, I like people's questions are so uh, are so central to the topic. I don't want to stop anyone. So I, like, I was leaning to the witnesses at the start because I felt it was important that we got an overview of, of, of the situation. But I think you know, this is something that's going to have to reconvene. But uh, I appreciate you um, stopping, um, Deputy Carty. Um, Deputy Kehoe, who requested, I suppose, this meeting, um, is waiting again there. So I'll let Deputy Kehoe next. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. I want to welcome Mr. Kavanagh and uh, Mr. Regan and the other representative from HRI and IHRB. And yes, uh, Chairman, I am the person who sent in the correspondence after reading uh, some of the national newspapers of a leading horse trainer. And I got very concerned because I have a very keen interest in horse racing. It's a very important industry to Ireland. And I don't want to see it going down the same way as other industries uh, have. And to Mr. Egan, I, want you, uh, I don't want you to pass the questions over to anybody else. If you could ask, answer these yourself. Mm. Um, uh, you, t you spoke there about information that you get is assessed and acted upon. Well, if it's anything by the amount of information that I have gotten over the last number of uh, weeks since I sent in this correspondent, I've been absolutely horrified and uh, very concerned, and actually by the day more concerned of what is happening within the IHRB and maybe what is not happening within the IHRB. 
uh, and uh, uh, people contacting your organisation saying that information is not being assessed and not being acted upon. Now, look, I, I have to believe these people who, who come to me and you have to prove uh, yourselves uh, not guilty. But I want to ask you a couple of questions about the IHRB accounts for 2018 and 2019. And I've been contacted by people uh, in the industry who are very concerned of what they've seen in your accounts. And why was the budget for the forensic equine unit cut by almost 500,000 units between, uh, 2018, between 2018 and, and uh, 2019? And you have repeatedly stated that the IHRB increases testing for prohibited drugs. Mm. But the figures for this show, uh, this is not to be true. Um, why did the race course samples decrease between 2017 and 2019? In 2017, there was 300 and, or 3,074. Uh, 2018, 3,034, and 2019, 3,004. If you could answer those uh, 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 questions, I, I have further questions for you. Okay, thank you very much, Deputy Kyo. Um, the first question in relation to information being um, coming into the IHRB and not being acted upon. I can categorically state if information comes into the IHRB, it is assessed and followed up. We have no reason not to follow up information if it comes into us. But we have, as Dr. Hillier referred to, the structure that's in place. Um, we, we would, if we got information, and I'm, I'm going to talk about another issue for a second, which where we got information recently, and it, and it led to a matter being investigated and um, dealt with by the referrals committee, where we, where we got information from a third party. Um, but all information is followed up, assessed, and followed up. So, if people have information, as I said before, on many occasions, it's incumbent on those people to give us that information, and we will act on it. It'll be assessed, uh, fed into our database or whatever, and acted upon. And that's, that's the way we operate. Your second question in relation to the accounts and anti-doping. Um, the, there, was the, there was a transfer from um, our original laboratory back in 2018 to LGC. LGC were appointed as part of um, the uh, a public procurement process. And uh, we felt that as Ireland was um, a world leader in uh, horse racing, that we needed a laboratory which was a world leader. And in order to... Um, terminate the existing contractual relationship with, with the laboratory that was uh, in place at the time we entered into a, a mediation process which resulted in a figure being paid and that was included in the 2018 accounts which is why there appears to have been a reduction between 2018 and 2019. With regard to the number of race course samples that um, are taken, um, that's as uh, Dr Hillier said earlier on, um, that is related to the number of winners and we, we also not, we test other horses uh, randomly. But again, um, Dr Hillier is the expert on that and I, I, I'd like Dr Hillier to comment on that specific point because it is, exact, it is her area. Okay, no, no, we'll just go back to, to Deputy Kyo. Do you want to further questions, okay, okay. Deputy Kyo? Uh, uh, um, um, uh, have you, um, uh, sorry, ha has there ever been a positive sample where no action uh, was taken and how many positive cases are pending and for what duration uh, that are ongoing at the moment? Uh, what, do you want me to take that answer or can I hand it over to you? Yeah, no, I, I would okay. prefer if you could. Right. Yeah. There has never been a, case, a positive finding where no action was taken. And I made that point in my opening statement, and I want to make it again. And thank you very much, Doc, Doc, or, um, Mr. Kyo, or Deputy Kyo, for giving me the opportunity to make it. So I can categorically state there has never been a positive finding with no action taken. Um, I think there's in the region of 10 um, uh, hearings waiting to be held at the moment. They're in the process of investigation, and we're expecting them to come to uh, certainly in the next month or two, two or three months. The, the hearings should be held, but there, there's, I think, there's ten in the system. Okay. And can, can you, can you, IHRB, you as the head of IHRB, confirm if there are any court injunctions against any of these pending uh, cases for any specific reason? Absolutely not. And there's never been a court injunction in relation to any anti-doping matter with us. You, you can confirm that there had never, ever been a court injunction? Never, in relation to anti-doping matters. 
Uh, that's okay. Uh, thank you. Tell me, I want to just to point out a little bit about why doesn't the IHRB disclose the uh, staff, uh, the, the salaries of, of the staff? Like you do get 10 million euros, I would think, in taxpayers' money uh, from the HRI. Uh, and I'd be interested in why, like, you have no competitor in the game, like, you, like there's no sensitivity, I don't believe there's any sensitivity, unless maybe you might be able to outline that there's some commercial sensitivity there. Like, like, like 10, 10 million euros, I think is that what Mr. Cavanagh uh, said the, the, the HRI gives to the IHRB mm. for their, for their um, um, yearly running your, your organisation. Mm. And why do you not uh, the, the, the disclose the, the, the salaries of your staff? Well, we're a very small organisation, and if we were to disclose salaries, it would be easily identifiable who's earning what. But um, the other point is, while HRI provide funding, we also there's also another source of income um, from licensing revenue and everything else, which is taken into account under legislation when determining our budget. So we're not fully funded by by public funds, but we are substantially funded by public funds. I don't accept your explanation saying you're a small organisation and that, uh, like, you know, I think this is taxpayers' money. Do you understand, like, this is taxpayers' money and, like, to, to, for the taxpayer to have value for money, I do believe and I do think uh, that you should be uh, disclosing the salaries. Just on the IHRB accounts for 2018, uh, I, I understand they were uh, incorrect and had to be restated to the amount of mm -hmm. 1.6 million. Would I be right in saying that? That's correct, yep. And the Controller and Auditor General concluded in his remarks, and I state, and uh, my opinion on the financial statements doesn't cover other information presented with those statements, and I do not express any form of assurance on, on the conclusion thereon. Were you surprised at such a statement from the Controller and Auditor General? Um, no, I'll answer that in a second, but I, I think the key point in relation to what the Controller and Auditor General said was that he said the accounts... Um, gave a true and fair view of the state of, of um, the IHRB's finances. And I think I want to stress that all money that was received by the IHRB has been accounted for. Um, that is a fairly, the, 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 uh, the audit only covers certain areas. It covers financial, um, the financial aspects of it. So that, it's, it's not surprising that the Controller and Auditor General did not express any opinion on areas that he didn't cover. But I want to stress there was a clean auditor opinion from the Controller and Auditor General and if there was any issue with the accounts, that would not have been the case. Yeah. Just going back to the salaries again, like would you would you um say like you know, if the taxpayer is given ten million euros, the tune of ten million and you know you're getting other sources of income as well, but mm. ten million euros being totally unaccounted for by the ta uh, uh, and the taxpayers get no account of absolutely whatsoever from your organisation. How is spent? Where is spent? Who's getting what? Or anything? Or, 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 or anything else? And uh, Deputy Kyo, no uh, fairness, no, and, uh, to say it's unaccounted for, uh, uh, you know, they, they, well, the accounts I, I, are audited. I won't say unaccounted. No, yes, but but, but uh, okay, I, 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 that, that I, I would not say it's unaccounted. Yeah, no, they're, they're, like, to say it unaccounted for now wouldn't be wouldn't be fair. Now, yeah. Deputy Kyo, I, I say I, t I would draw the statement unaccounted for. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Deputy Kyo. But the situation, I, I, I go back to, you know, the, the Controller and Auditor General has given us a, a clean audit opinion, and also on an annual basis, we, we and, and I, pre I acknowledge you withdrew the statement, but just to, for the record, I just want to say that we presented a detailed budget, a line-by-line -line budget to Horse Racing Ireland on an annual basis um, as, as to how we spend our money. Yeah, and uh, just uh, just on one other thing, just uh, I have loads of questions, but I want to get, be, be be fair to other members as well. H how does if I wanted to get on the IHRB, how would I go about it? Um, well, you can apply to become a race day steward, and there's a training scheme in place for uh, all race day stewards, and uh, it takes about 12 months to qualify because it's very important that all our members, uh, all the race day stewards, are appropriately trained because they carry out a very important role. And the one thing I want to stress as well, talking about value for money, none of our members get any, or none of the race day stewards get any payment. They don't get travel expenses. They get absolutely nothing. And many of them sit on IHRB committees, disciplinary committees, and we're fortunate that we've got a lot of experts in the industry. We've got experts from all walks of life um, that voluntarily give their time to the IHRB for the benefit of the sport. And I think that's something that gets overlooked. And I'd like to uh, pay tribute to the members who actually do that. And I think the, the industry recognises the contribution that they make. 
Uh, absolutely, and uh, like any sport or organisation, the volunteers is is very important to it. Like a lot of people would say to me, that the IHRB is not fit for purpose, and I'm only quoting what has been told to me. Yeah. What 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 what, what would you think? As far as uh, we believe that we, we've got an excellent organisation, a very progressive organisation. I think you've seen the strides we've made in anti-doping, um, which is um, huge. We, we, we've got unique powers now. We've got authorised officer status, which no other authority has. We can walk in to any stable yard or any yard, any thoroughbred horse, anywhere. We've got a very fair disciplinary system. We there was uh, we were challenged in the Supreme Court back in 2013, and we were we won the case. That and and in fairness to the person that challenged us, he said there was no issue with the fairness or impartiality of the system. And I'm very proud of the IHRB and and the work that it does. Um, I've represented the IHRB internationally on many committees. Um, I think that the fact that the IHRB is is as progressive as it is is reflected by the fact that we're on every international national committee in racing um, worldwide, that uh, influential committee. And I think that's very important for the benefit of Irish racing. And I'm proud of the work that the IHRD does. I, I, I just two, two quick questions, Sherman, then I'm finished. Um, um, uh, to, to Mr. Um, um, to the IHR, IHRB first, can, can IHRB confirm that all gallop fees have been properly accounted for in the last 12 months? That's number one. And number two to Ms. Hillard, prior to arrangements uh, being made for IHRB to visit non-licensed yards, uh, were you aware that some trainers uh, and this has only been given to me uh, 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 by some of the anonymous stuff that I've received in, where, where trainers were moving horses to non-licensed yards frequently where they may have been uh, getting drug treatment. And were you aware of, of this abuse and did you concentrate your efforts uh, or the IHRB efforts on trainers as, uh, who were using this practice? If Ms Hillary could uh, answer that and uh, if uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the head of the IHRB could just talk about the gallop fees and then I, I'll let her remember saying. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll be very, very brief. Uh, yes, we're aware of horse movement and yes, we've done something about it in pursuing our authorised authorized officer status. Can you confirm what you've done on it? We we have authorised officer status, which now means that we're tracking horses. So over the last month, if we if we come to a yard and a horse that's supposed to be there isn't there, we've been following it, finding it, identifying it, and testing it. And have there been any horses been moved? Horses move all the time. The, the horses no, no, do no. move. I, I, have Have you found anything uh, improper? No. No, no, not, not but, okay. but the horse, horse, the horses move the whole time for, for perfectly good reasons. But what we're doing now is we're able to follow them. Okay. I, 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 I think, uh, Deputy Kyo, you might be asking me the question about gallop fees. Uh, sorry, 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 uh, Brian, sorry, Mr. Catton, I should have asked you about that. Sorry. Yeah. I, no. I don't, sorry, can you just, I don't fully understand this. Uh, uh, can you confirm that all gallop fees have been properly accounted for in the past 12 months? In, in, in what sense? Public? Right, uh, right, right, right across all race courses. Uh, yes, to the best of my knowledge, uh, that, that this is where horses go to race courses for a gallop after racing or the day after racing? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank, thank you, you very much, I have plenty of other questions, but Chairman, I, I know I, I want to be fair to other members. Okay, but I think I think we're going to have to reconvene because I don't think there's any, I have any hope of getting through the agenda. So Deputy Collins is, Deputy Collins is next. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and, and, and I welcome our witnesses. I only have two questions as such. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I have no issue, obviously, with uh, our government giving uh, funding towards uh, horse racing, uh, the same as the greyhound industry or anything else. It's, it's, it's a great sport and it's enjoyed by so many. Uh, as long as the, the use of uh, the funds are, are divided equally along all the sectors of horse racing, right down to the ground, and I attend, you know, I'm not, I'm not big into horse racing, there's no point in saying that, because mainly farming and, 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 and fishing is down this side of the country. Um, but at the same time, I do attend the local road trotting races in the Goldene, the Doris, the Dermot Egan, Bendon, the Scotland, and I see that they find it, they have huge difficulty in, 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 in uh, paying their insurance and continuing their racing. So I'd just like to see that the, the funds that are given by government is, is, is going down to the people on the ground as well as people at the top. Um, and as I said, I don't, I don't have a massive skin in the game, but I have a careful eye on what is going on uh, because... Uh, you know, there's a lot of issues out there at present, uh, and 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 that needs to be explained uh, properly. And for the sake of accountability and taxpayers' money, 
I personally believe that the HRB, the Turf Club, should be dismantled, that an independent police in Bali be set up to police and regulate Irish horse fishing. This body could be answerable to the HRI, to this government and this committee, the Ag Agricultural Marine Committee. I'm sure at this stage it has become obvious that there are serious issues within the IHRB that are unacceptable and should be no longer allowed to continue. And the two questions I have to ask, one may be for uh, Mr Kavanagh and, and the other for uh, Dr Lynn Hilliard, but anybody else that wants to answer them, they're quite welcome to do so. One is, do you think... Uh, do you think that it's acceptable that a self-elected gentleman's club receiving government funding of up to nine million last year are not answerable to anybody? And the second question, with regard to the steroid drug situation, are there any current positive results not dealt with? Thank you, Mr. Kavla. Uh, I, 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 I don't. I, I think the first question is is above my pay grade, Deputy Collins. It's. It, 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 I don't think it's fair to say that the IHRB are not answerable to anybody. Uh, as, as Ms Regan has explained, uh, they, they are required to account uh, on, a, on, a, on a monthly basis to Horse Racing Ireland for the spending of their funds. Uh, they're audited annually by the Controller and Auditor General, uh, and there's a, a regular day-to-day uh, 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 -day relationship with Horse Racing Ireland. Uh, I outlined at the start the legislative structure, the, the legislative framework that, uh, that uh, applies in horse racing, and that's a matter for legislators to, to, to set out. We work within the framework that, 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 that we have, uh, and uh, as I said, the structure has delivered an industry which, uh, which uh, is, is, is a, pride, a source of pride for the country and can be a source of pride for the country, and it's also a sector in which Ireland performs uh, uh, exceedingly well internationally. This is, a, this is a sector in which Ireland has natural advantages our climate, our soil structure, our people, and a history of political support, which has very strongly created a structure. So it's a valuable industry. Uh, the structure is set out in legislation. We apply it, but uh, I wouldn't accept the, the suggestion that the uh, IHRB are not answerable to, to anybody. Um, uh, uh, so um, the second question, I think, is a question for, for, for Dr. Hillier. I can, I can answer very simply, very categorically, and very clearly, no, we haven't. And that's in spite of taking nearly two and a half thousand samples this year, with all the complexities I've gone into and in the interest of time I won't go into again unless unless you wish me to, but no, not a hint. Nothing. Okay. Um, Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Um, I have a, uh, still a good few a good few members. We're looking again. Senator Mullen, um, you're next on my list. Um, Deputy Brown was Chairman. Deputy Brown Chairman. was next on my list. Chairman. Sorry, Senator. Before, order now. Just Senator. A point of order. before I let you I'm in. a member of this committee and I expect to come in before members that are not members of the committee. So but he's substituted for someone this morning, Deputy Ring. So I don't care what they did or not now. I'm a member of the committee and I attend the meetings and I expect that I'd be brought in before okay. I have my hand up now from, from the very beginning. I have my hand up and I'm disappointed. But that's fine, Chairman. Go ahead now. But I am just I just want to put it on the record. I'm disappointed. Well, all was an unwritten rule in in, in, in Dal Airden. Members of the committee always got the first right, and any guests that came in after could, could contribute after. Well, but the members of the committee were always let go first, and I'm disappointed. Well, maybe I'm wrong, Mr. Ring, but, or Deputy Ring, but I thought when he was substituted that he had the same... That he had the same no, no, he does not. He does not. It's the members of the committee, and you can check that rule. I'm a long time in this House oh. now, and there was always an unwritten oh, rule here advice. that whoever was on the committee, oh. the committee members got in first, and other people that came in when it suits them to come in, uh, they would be let in after. But the committee members, you can check that as chairman, but that was always an unwritten rule in Dal Ayrton, and I'm here a long time. Well, if I make the mistake, Deputy Ring, I apologise. But I thought, That's OK. Oh, that's fine. I thought, I, I thought when Senator Mullen was substituted that he had the same rights, and if that I'm wrong, I apologise. Not, not a member of the committee. And it's well, not, I, I think, personally against uh, Deputy Mullen, or, um, Senator Mullen, but I'm a member of the committee. No, I Mike said, Fitzmaurice is here as well, Chairman. I don't know if my hand up. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, lads, everyone had their hand up within two minutes of the meeting starting this morning. But not, Yes. So, uh, I, 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 Hanerling, may, may I clarify the situation? Yes, Senator. Yeah, just, just to be clear, I had intended at all points to attend this meeting. If I had done so just as a guest, as an ordinary member of the Oireachtas, what, what Deputy Ring is saying is indeed true, I would have to wait until all members of the committee uh, had, had had their chance. I am here, however, having been substituted as a member of the same group as Senator Victor Boyan, who is a, a full member of the committee. 
And understanding orders in that context, I sit as though I was a member of the committee. It's a different situation to where I just to turn up as an ordinary member of the Oireachtas without substituting for a member of the committee. That is my understanding of the standing yeah, orders. And this was no, checked with the yesterday. Yeah, no, I accept oh. that, and I'm not seeking to jump in ahead of anyone. I'm not entitled to it. Uh, but I'm great. here as a member Someone of the committee. Someone get on asking the questions because we need to get going. Because Agreed. We okay. Well, that so was my, I that, 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 no, no, Michael, I, I, so we want to get on. And if we have to stay another hour, I don't mind, or two hours, I don't mind. But there has always been a run on written ruling committees that whoever is on the committee gets the first right. And I have nothing against Senator Mullen. He's a good representative and he may be substituting, but a substitute is only a substitute in any sport. OK, if I'm wrong, uh, Senator well, I'm Mullen. Not, I, 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 I've, lined, I've, dug, I've tugged out and lined out now, so I'd, I'd better try and play. Um, can I just address my first question to Mr Kavanagh? Uh, from what you said a moment ago, um, there is a level of accountability of the high HRB uh, to the taxpayer. But is it the same level of accountability um, as you, as HRI, have? They get, if I understand it correctly, 9.6 million this year. Um, certainly 9 million out of 13 million is taxpayers' money going to IHRB through you. Now, are they as accountable to the taxpayer as you are? Um, are, are, is the taxpayer in a better position, for example, to know the salaries in your organisation than they are in relation to IHRB? Uh, as I understand it, uh, Senator Mullen, it's, it's a broadly similar accountability. Uh, it's set out in legislation. Uh, I understand that the chief executive of the IHRB since 2016, uh, uh, it was the Turf Club at the time, is, is liable to come and appear before an Oireachtas committee when requested and to, uh, to answer to them. Uh, I don't believe that the Chief Executive is an accounting officer in the same sense that I'm an accounting officer of a, of, of a state body, but the IHRB is not a state. Not, not and a that's state. the point. And yeah. therefore, is it fair to say that there isn't the same level of accountability, for example, through the Controller and Auditor, Auditor General to the public? Uh, I, I believe there is, I believe it's broadly similar, Senator Mullen. I don't. I, I, I believe if, if the Public Accounts Committee wished to uh, uh, um, um, uh, invite the chief executive in to discuss the accounts of the IHRB that that was possible. Dennis, so correct, we're, me, but, we're, we're, correct, we're no, correct me if I'm saying something wrong, but that's yeah. my understanding of it. Yeah, under section 12 of the uh, Horse Racing Ireland Act 2016, it sets out clearly what our responsibilities are with regard to the keeping of um, proper books of yeah. accounts. Can you keep that please I'm now, please? <laughs> yeah, I know I'm not going to give chapter. I'm trying, to establish, I'm trying to establish whether we're as entitled. Uh, whether we have no more entitlement to know the salaries in Mr. Kavanagh's organisation than we are in yours. What is the position? Is it the same situation? Uh, I, I don't know, is the answer. It, 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 that, that's a, a, a matter for the Code of Governance of State Bodies, uh, which, which Horse Racing Ireland as a state body obviously has to operate under. Uh, as I said, the IHR... So, so, that's, so, so that suggests to me that we, are, we have less access to information because IHRB are not in the same position as yourselves. They're not, they're not a semi-state body, but they are a, a body referred to in legislation, and there are obligations on uh, the chief executive and, and the body which are broadly similar to those of, 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 of Horse Racing Ireland. Okay, but you're well, correct, correct, it is not a state body. Yeah, well, and I think the point has been made that you have a situation where nearly 10 million and the bulk of the money of IHRB is coming from the taxpayer through yourselves and people aren't in a position to know salaries. That, that's an interesting and important point. Now, I want to ask about the Turf Club stroke IHRB. IHRB um, is an emanation uh, of the tur Turf Club. It's a f effectively a self-selecting organisation that includes in some cases the owners of, uh, of horses how is it acceptable for an organisation that is a self-selecting club to be the, regular, the regulatory organisation, and particularly in relation to uh, something as sensitive as drug, uh, as integrity and 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 drug testing? Um, is that not an anachronism? Uh, no, we've got a very detailed governance manual and top of the list is conflicts of interest. Every member of the organisation has got to declare conflicts of interest. It comes up at every single meeting and at no stage um, they, they opt out if there's anything to do with which may be conflict. 
Yes, but of course, I'm not suggesting that, uh, that I have any evidence that people intervene uh, in favour of their own situation. But perception is everything. Just as in mm. a court, justice isn't just to be done, it has to be seen to be done. There are examples internationally of regulatory bodies in relation to, to, to this industry, where nobody who is involved in owning, breeding or training can have hand, act or part. Uh, in, in the regulatory body. So just to take an example, perfectly legitimate thing, your own chairman, uh, Mr. McCalmont, was reported as having sold a yearling for 1.3 million to cool more. Nothing wrong with that. But isn't it wrong that a person with a financial interest in the industry could have any role with the regulatory body, even if they're not in an executive role? Isn't it a bad look? Uh, I wouldn't Senator, accept Senator that. Mullen, the, the situation. Mullen, well, no, 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 uh, hold on for a second. Senator Mullen, to refer to a, a person who's operating in the industry to his private business, I don't think is appropriate. So I would like you to, you know, to, refra to rephrase your question, please. Okay, isn't it, wouldn't it be inappropriate for anybody who would be in, in any involved in selling or trading with horses to have any role in relation to a regulatory body with responsibility for anti-doping? I'm not suggesting that they're involved in the executive or in the day-to-day, -day, but in terms of the perception of things, in the perception of this being a clean situation, and given that you're a self-selecting body, okay, your members, your directors are not appointed by the government, isn't there something out of date and something unhealthy about the whole appearance of that? I, I, don't, I don't agree with you there. Um, the uh, people, the majority of people involved in the IHRB have expertise, which is important for horse racing. And I reiterate again, we've got a very, very strict conflict of interest policy in place. And anybody that has a conflict of interest does not get involved in any decision which may um, be of benefit to them. We've got We've got about, I think there's about 120 odd stewards around the country. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with horse racing, but if you look at the inquiry reports at the, any, at the end of any given day, you may see Mr. Whoever absented himself from that inquiry. They will stand out. And the advantage we have of using expertise is we've got a very good, um, we've got very good expertise available to us. It's beneficial to the sport to have that expertise because you can't have referees in a sport who actually don't understand the sport. I see, racing, I see, I see racing every weekend on two channels because I have a family member who, who's passionate about it. So I'm, I'm following it hmm. some, somewhat vicariously, but never unwillingly. But what I would yeah. say is this, it's clear to me from all that I've seen that racing is a family. And in any such family situation, um, there, there, there has to be scrupulousness about keeping people away from decision making. And I think the concern is that the IHRB is a closed shop effectively. It's a closed shop that's getting taxpayers' money. And some of the people involved in it might well be owners, people who, who, who are involved in the buying and selling of bloodstock. And I'm saying to you that there are examples internationally where regulatory bodies in this type of situation can't, that the people involved, the directors involved, uh, can't have hand actor part in owning, bu buying or selling. Now, Mr. Bulger is a thorn in your side quite clearly right so, now. He has, so, he has, as you said, you sorry, are saying you sorry, are well, frustrated. Sorry, Senator Mullen, Senator Mullen uh, I'd refer, yeah. uh, just, you can say this a thorn in the side, but I'd like you not to be identifying a, a, a particular person. Okay, but I do want to talk about the issues that Mr. Bulger has raised. No, because uh, well, they, well, they, well, uh, Senator Mullen, you're not listening to me. I said you cannot identify someone, someone directly. Uh, that was clearly oh, stated at the start. Okay. OK, so in relation to claims that are made by people who have a high reputation, uh, who are uh, people of long standing in, in the industry, people who have a completely clean record, and people who say that they have you know, moral certainty uh, that there is a problem and that drug taking is the number one problem. Now, you, you come in here and you say that you're frustrated and disappointed by recent allegations. And everything we've heard so far you've been telling us, we have the powers. And you're saying, because you have the powers, there is no systemic problem of drug taking. But really, all you have really proven to us is that you haven't found evidence yourselves of the systemic problems. But if I'm to ask you about out-of-competition testing, only now is that happening. Um, CCTV at race tracks, not yet. A detailed equine anti-doping report to be presented twice yearly, published for the first time last week. I mean, it seems to me like you're getting serious now. And it seems to me that you might owe a debt uh, to the people who have 
the very prominent people of high reputation who have been expressing concern about what they say is going on in the industry. Would you accept that? Yeah, everyone is entitled to their opinion and um, we don't agree with it, but Dr Hillier is the expert in this area and she, she can set out exactly um, responses to the very important points that you have made with regard to our, our, our anti-doping programme. I think this goes back to what we said earlier. We welcome information intelligence from anybody and we will deal with it. Um, if any person, whether they be a, um, a world leading trainer or a member of Sable staff, whether they're a vet, whoever they are, we will listen to them. And I need to really stress this, they're not a thorn in our side. People are entitled to their opinion. They may have views, they may have evidence, they may have information. Well, Dr Hillier, sorry but, to interrupt well, you. Well, I'll just Senator Mullen, let Dr Hillier finish. Senator Mullen. But, Senator Mullen. 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 And its consequences. Um, I think Dr. Pierce has probably very clearly explained it, but just, but just, but just really he headline stuff. We ask, stroke, tell our lab to detect as much as they can of prohibited at all times substances, the drugs that shouldn't be there. That's exactly what happened here. What, but what happens with any of these? prohibited at all times drugs is that there'll always be one lab slightly moving ahead a little bit quicker than another and that's exactly what happened here but actually perhaps i ought to say dr, dr. pierce clive would you like to just step in briefly well sorry I, i've no issue with the findings it, 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 at the lab end my my issue is what happened in ireland arising out of that case because you know okay. that's a case that's associated with the withdrawal of certain horses from a race card right what, so what, what consequences what was what was the net issue that arose in that case who was the wrongdoing in that case and who was to blame for that wrongdoing and what action was taken against whoever was to blame there was no wrongdoing so there was no action to be taken against wrongdoing what happened was you had two laboratories who were doing their job so lch were doing their job detecting what they thought they should detect LGC, the names are a bit similar, were doing their job detecting what they thought they should detect. So in answer to our role in this as the regulator, the minute that news broke, we were on the telephone to our, and immediately to our laboratory, then to our colleagues in France, then to our colleagues in Britain, in, in that order. We convened immediate meetings, immediately, and I, mean, and I mean immediately, whatever time it was at night.
Oh, wait, sorry, Chair. Senator Mullen. I, 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 like, like, like Deputy Carthy said earlier, the only reason Senator, I'm interrupting Senator is Mullen, I'm conscious Senator of Mullen. of time. Can you move him? Senator Mullen, Just, you're not respecting the Chair. I want to let the witness finish her answer and please respect the Chair. Senator, um, oh, Senator, oh, sorry, I don't mean to disrespect the Chair. I was only meaning to follow uh, Deputy Carthy's example. You're, interrupt, you're interrupting the witness giving her answer on a frequent basis, so I'm letting the witness finish her answer okay. and then you I can apologize. come back I apologise. I thought that that was permitted where we were short of time. I was trying to let other no, people in. No, no, you're, you're, interrupt, I, you're interrupting the witness, Senator Mullen. Senator Mullen, we're talking about the same Senator case. Mullen, Senator Mullen, Senator Mullen. You're interrupting the witness. Let the witness finish, uh, Dr. Dr. Hillier. My understanding of the question, and, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding of the question is what's happened now. What, what was kind of what, what, what was the what was the upshot of that? The laboratories are harmonised on that particular substance, and we continue to work with. It's actually triggered new professional relationships with feed manufacturers and the groups associated with them here, which are ongoing. I suppose what I'm trying to establish, Dr. Hillier, is wasn't that a case where there was an, where there was a substance in an additive that went into feed that was supplied, and that the Department of Agriculture was interested? Uh, it was established that that feed was in certain in the feed that went to horses, but only in certain stables. And I'm just wondering, like, what did you find? Was there wrongdoing in that case? Why was that substance in the feed? That, the investigation was led by the department into into the matter because it was it was a matter for the Food Standards Agency. But we yes. collaborated and assisted where we could okay. with the results of Dr. our testing Dr. and more Hillier, particularly the, the testing would, overseas. The so are you saying that there the might have been sorry, wrongdoing Senator in that Mullen. case, but that it's outside Senator of Mullen. the immediate remit? Senator Mullen, I mean, just, 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 that, lads, just in case there's a misunderstanding, I'm chaired in the meeting, just in case there's a misunderstanding, the department will be in the front of us next Tuesday and they will, they, we can ask them questions on, on their actions in relation to that. I think that's a question more appropriate to the department. OK, Mr Senator Mullen? Thank you, Chair. Can I, can I ask just one last question? Well, two, just two quick last questions then. Um, Dr Hiller, you've, you've heard what I've said about the, the regulatory body, the fact that the regulatory body is effectively a, a closed shop uh, and the fact that it is um, responsible, um, it's direct, it has no directors uh, appointed by the state, it doesn't have an independent uh, uh, state appointed uh, chairperson. Um, it, it, there isn't the perception that there is a complete separation uh, if you have situations where directors could be involved in the industry. Yeah. I, I, uh, I might is just, that I a might problem just, for you as the executive person, that the no. perception is a problem? I might just hop in there. There is absolutely no crossover between what we do as an executive and, for example, the board or members. Absolutely no crossover whatsoever. It might be worth me mentioning here that I come from a background of having worked in an independent regulatory authority in the form of the Jockey Club previously, before it became part of the BHA. I absolutely... Um, support wholeheartedly the concept of an independent regulator. I think it's crucial. Now, I know that, as, as, as Mr Egan has said, there are expert, experts in the form of the members and the stewards who benefit the organisation, but I need to be crystal clear. They have absolutely nothing to do with our disciplinary, our regulatory processes, our um, processing of cases, knowledge of cases. There is no knowledge of cases. The first a member will hear of a case is when it is presented to the referrals panel. That is the first time they'll hear of it. It will usually be the first time the board will hear it. The only time the board will be made aware of such a matter is if it has already been processed and investigated, documented and catalogued, and is then they are made aware if it's got particular profile or of particular significance that they need to be aware of. So something like the Zilpatrol, the Zilpatrol event, okay. clearly the board needed to be briefed on that. Thank, thank you, Dr. Hillard. Um, we're moving on now to Deputy Ring. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman, I, I'll be brief. Um, to just, uh, I just want to ask a few simple questions. Uh, you say that there were 2,449 samples were taken in the first six months of the year, with 28% of those taken as part of out-of-competition testing programme. Is there a list of uh, who was tested, and how do we get that list, or had that list been published? And if not, why isn't the list being published? And the other issue that has been alleged to me is in, in relation to yards. Is certain yards all the time that are being tested and other yards are not being tested? I'd like you to respond to that first. The first um, question is, yeah. is, is, is there a list of which horses have been sampled? There is yes. a database. Of, it's, it's, it's in a number of different places because the, the, the horses, as I've said already, are anonymised. So there's a list of sample codes 
which can be decoded to give a list of horses. Now, that isn't done. In all honesty, that's not done unless we have an adverse finding. In relation to your second question, forgive me, I've had a mind... Your second question was in relation to... The, is, is the, the, the list been... Uh, are the yards being visited? The yards being visited. Why is it the same yards all the no, time? No, it's no, no, to not... Me. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, no, go ahead. Sorry, there. I beg your pardon. No, not, not at all. The way in which the yards for, for testing and or inspecting are selected is on a risk basis. I have a database now, which we've developed over the last couple of years, of all our licensed trainers and handlers. They are ranked in, I, I use a traffic light system, red, amber, green, as to uh, a red obviously is a yard where perhaps there has been a positive or a, a concern or intelligence information has come in. A, a so-called red yard will be visited more frequently than a so-called green yard. Any yard that has never been inspected will be a so-called red yard by definition because we need to go in and we need to establish if it's post-licensing. So the, I'm, I'll, I'll be, try and be concise. There is a, a system, a risk-based, intelligence-based system. It, it, this is real. This isn't just fancy words. This is real. And it's, what, it's how we select the yard. The yard today that's being visited right now is as a result of that risk assessment. I will say there are two things that will always trump that risk assessment. One is horse welfare. If we have a horse welfare concern, complaint, whatever it's written on, however it comes in, we act. And we will act immediately, usually in conjunction with the department or other agencies, because we can't take the chance that that, that may be true, if that makes sense. The other thing that will always trigger an immediate response is if there is real evidence of a prohibited at all times substance, because by definition, we would have to capture that evidence as quickly as possible. And again, sorry, that would be in conjunction with the department, with the investigations division, but I, I believe you'll hear more about that, that work later. Right. Within the past six months, have any samples ever gone missing, blood, urine or hair? No, categorically not, no. Right. And the six months previous to that? No, not on my watch, not in the That's last five right. years. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the terms of the, our, our, at the moment, in the present cases, uh, are you aware of an injunction being held or being taken out in relation to uh, a scheduled hearing? Is that no. true? Or no, no, absolutely been, not been, true. Was, no. And honestly, that's fine. Uh, did you take any steps to follow up on the contaminated feed issue last autumn, where the, the, the feed was contaminated? Did you do anything in relation to that? Yes, we immediately, as I say, contacted international colleagues and, and made sure that we had a handle, if you like, on what was going on. We then increasingly, because we hadn't had the dialogue before, worked with the Food Sa Safety Agency, Food Standards Agency, to make sure that we could help them wherever we needed to with samples. So, and just, so yes, and, just, and there's actually ongoing actions from that now. And just, Deputy Ring, I would say the department, when they're in next Tuesday, will have questions to answer as regards feed, because the regulations on feed will be under their, 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 their portfolio. Right, and the, 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 thank you. Um, the, the other, in relation to, to uh, the whistleblower and in relation to Paul Kimmage, and Paul Kimmage, to be fair, I was Minister for Sport, and I have to say that Paul Kimmage has been consistent all his life and been very brave and honest in relation to all sports, and horse racing is a sport, and we must protect that sport, protect that industry. Uh, the people that are in it, there's a lot of jobs, a lot of valuable jobs. It's a very valuable industry to the country. But at the same time, the sporting spectator must also know, must also know that whoever that they are betting on, that that horse uh, is equal to the horse that they're, that they're running against. And has anybody from 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 any of the organisations made contact with Paul Kimmage to talk to him in relation to the allegations that he has? We we as we as an organisation have have had communication with and from Mr. Um, Kimmage. So I missed that. Sorry. Thank you. We as an organisation have had, I haven't personally, but we as an organisation have had communication from and contact with Mr Kimmage. Yes, and, and, and an, an earlier question was in relation to, to allegations that are made. And as a politician and everybody here around the table, except yourselves, are politicians, and we get anonymous letters all the time, and we get complaints made against us in relation to that's not true. But are all complaints that actually come into you investigated? Yes. All complaints. Yes, anything that's crossed, as Mr. Egan explained earlier, anything that is received, however 
um, however it, much, it may not make sense at the time or however small or large the information is, has to be logged because we don't know what that information could lead to in two weeks' time, two months' time, two years' time when put together with other information. It's yeah. really important. And the other thing is I think it takes a lot for somebody to pick up the phone, write a note, put a stamp on an envelope and send things in to me. So it, it's imperative that we take note of it. Imperative. Right. And, and just my final question, you know, in relation again to the allegations that were made, made publicly in relation to uh, names of trainers, a list of 20 horses doped and some of the substances used, have you got that information? I haven't personally. That was, I think it was said in the piece, it was 10 years ago. If, if, oh, if, yeah. if all, I can, all I can do is reiterate, if information such as that comes in, it will be acted upon. That's fine. That's, um, that's, that's, that's all I have to ask for now. Deputy Fitzmaurice. All right, thanks, Chairman. Uh, thanks to the witnesses. I'll get going, and I want to answer pretty brief and short because I know Joe Flaherty is trying to get in as well there. Um, Mr. Egan, you referred to 12 officials as authorised officers uh, to inspect yards and unlicensed premises. Um, this is like farmers, in my opinion, uh, basically kind of regulating themselves. Is this not a bad system when... Um, if you look back on, on a previous regime where the Department of Agriculture took the lead on inspections, especially some high-profile ones, um, were we not better to have the likes of the Department of Agriculture uh, looking after it? Well, we will bring in the Department of Agriculture with us uh, if, as Dr Hillier said earlier on, if we're very concerned about a place. If we get... For example, if we get a screening finding back from the laboratory which indicates that there's an anabolic steroid, we will get to the department and go in immediately. Right. Okay. Right. Um, it has been admitted uh, that a quarter of a tonne of nitro, nitro uh, tin came into this country. Was all that accounted for? I can't answer that question. Um, I, we, there was one trainer prosecuted on foot of um, finding nitrotain. In, the department found nitrotain in his yard, but it's really um, a matter for the Department of Agriculture because it's an illegal substance that was brought in. So it's not your problem? Well, it, 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 the, fall, uh, the fallout from right. it could be our problem, but it's not specifically our, um, okay, our problem. Right. We have a concern, obviously, because it was brought in. When the authorised officers go to yards, obviously there's a lot of security and all of that. Is there any, um, you know, how long does it take them to get in with security and everything? Is there a danger of um, horses being moved mm. or I'm, substances? Yeah. I might step in. I yeah. might step in there if that's okay. Having having yeah. been at the cold face the last few weeks, um, most times the gates are open. In all honesty, most times the gates are open. And with the warrant cards, we've made a policy decision now that all of our inspections will be under the auspices of the warrant cards, rather than going okay. in right. under the auspices. So, so, to cut, so to, uh, can I just say that we're proportionate. If if, if we have, if we had reason to believe that there was an issue, and I've been on inspections with the department where that has been the case, measures are taken, and by measures I'm. Right. Mean, okay. Proper reconnaissance, okay. back gates, vehicles okay. not allowed to leave, that type of thing. Okay. Um, um, right. What is the current status of the contract with uh, LGC Laboratories and when is that due to expire? We have a year to run and we'll be starting the procurement process again next year. Okay. Uh, you referred earlier on to Dr. Turden Swan. Um, there was, why won't the IRHB? release findings of an expert report by, by uh, Turton Swan into a previous um, lab? I can't answer that. What I will say is that Dr Wan's recommendations are now being enacted. I can't answer the, the, the question about the why release of the document. Why hasn't it been released? I'd have to defer to Mr. Egan for that. It was a report commissioned on the lab, which was presented to the IHRB board, and um, it was uh, it was acted upon by the IHRB board at the time. But if taxpayers' money is going, you know, if there's money going from taxpayers, then all reports entitled to be released. Well, I suppose there was there was um, uh, the report referred to a commercial issues of a commercial nature, and of course, I absolutely uh, regard the sanctity of taxpayers' money. But there there are occasions when there's confidentiality issues on with, with regard to reports. But if it's a report into a previous lab, what's the big deal of of not releasing it? Well, as I said, there's issues between, uh, with regard to commercial sensitivity, with, with regard to um, that particular laboratory, and we can't put something into the public domain without the consent of that laboratory because it was a joint report. Right. Um, and did you pay for it? 
We've had for the report. It, it didn't. It was a relatively cheap report, and I'm not saying cheap in the sense of. If I pay um, for something, I'm dying entitled to put it out there. Uh, well, you are with the there was uh, with the consent of the other party. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, I'm going moving on. Um, is there any plans to increase uh, the out competition here, Tristan? Uh, like, and what plans specifically? Like, I think it's, it's the 383 samples in the first six months of 2021. Can yeah. you just bring me a quick we, read of that? Yeah, we will. We will be increasing. We we were affected by COVID. I don't. You know, it's, it's the reality. We had to be sensitive to. In in February, we were able to do a little bit more when restrictions eased, and then back again to to, to minimum and emergency only, if you like, in in March. So yes, we we do have plans. In okay. terms of where and when and how, that will depend on intelligence and risk, as I as I right. already said. Right. Now, you staged, and you probably stated basically that five thousand samples have been done in 2021. Yeah. Um, a quarter of them will be on race day. Um, now, if you talk to people in basically in the in the vits, to put it to put it simple, that um, they say that steroid use uh, during training can help. Um, so, why are you concentrating most of the samples on race day, as again trying to you know hit it with most of them earlier on? If this is a problem, if this could cause a problem. It's a good question, and it's why we've shifted our focus, as I said, from 9% out of competition testing in 2016 to nearly 30% now. Um, that's a direction of travel I want to maintain. You're, you're absolutely right. The horses spend most of their time at home. That's where we have to focus our efforts. What I wanted to do was get the authorised office, the warrant cards in place so that we could undertake even further testing, and that's where and we are And are you now. changing that around, what I've said? I'd, li I'd like to. It, it, we're moving in what that I'd direction. What I'd like to and doing Sorry. is two different I intend, things. I intend to. I plan plan to um, the distribution at the moment is 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 also protecting the racehorse. The, obviously, our horses winning on on our courses here has yeah. has tremendous implication. We have to protect that as well. It's a balance between the two. Um, you basically say that Ireland is a world leader in drug sampling. Um, Twelve percent to think of runners were treated in 2019. 15.5 percent in Britain, 17.5 percent in France. 31.7 percent in Japan. Uh, out, uh, like, do you stand over this with, when you look at the figures in other countries in 19 that I've gone through? I do, because it, as I said earlier, it's, it's about the quality of sampling and the nature of the sampling, not just the numbers, it's the two together. So if you compare us with our nearest neighbours, it's about 10% of, of, of samples of horses that run are sampled, and we are running at that same percentage. We have a greater percentage out of competition, as we've just discussed, how important that is, and that's the direction we're going to maintain. Well, uh, the, our nearest neighbours of the UK, I think 15.5% yes. is what they're at. Uh, in 2019, it was 10%. Well, so I, the, the figures I got, and it's from the, it's from um, Mark Bylan of the Racing Post. Would that be the, okay. the thing? That's what I've read. The, um, anyway. Do you intend to up that? I'd like to. I'd like to, but everything has to be put in a balance. I, right. I, as I say, final, I think it's quality. Quality one of testing. One final question, because I wanted to end Joe Flaherty. Um, and I noticed that uh, the smaller breeders, um, a problem arose last year. Um, the Department of Agriculture would have been involved in it. Um, the authorising agents, um, where when a foal was born, you, you're supposed to get a book. But these books mysteriously were heading towards the person, uh, the basically the, the stud. Um, why would that be? Or why wouldn't it? Why I, I, wouldn't may have, I may have to leave that for the department, I'm afraid. So you're not involved in that at all, are you? No. Right. OK, thank you. Okay, um, lads, um, you know, there has been very intensive discussions here, and obviously this is a hugely important issue. And I know uh, Deputy O'Flaherty is there waiting to get in, but we are over time. Um, I have three or four other deputies said they had more questions to ask earlier. And um, Deputy Brown had to leave. He was sharing another committee, and I know he he's extremely, obviously, um, the part of the country from the same as myself, he's extremely interested in, in, this, in this topic. What I'm going to suggest, um, if, if it is okay with the witnesses, we are um, reconvening as a committee on, the on, on Tuesday week. Um, it's outside the Dáil sittings, but we're reconvening on Tuesday week. And I would say that we'd, we'd um, adjourn this session and we'd reconvene then um, to finish, um, to finish um, the questions with, with HRI and IHRB. Um, because I want to be fair, and I, I, was, I give great latitude to every member this morning because, and to the witnesses, because I knew this was an extremely important topic and I wanted it to be fully understood and give everyone the opportunity. 
If it was in non-COVID times, we just can't, can't continue for another hour or two, but I'm restricted to two hours because of COVID. So that's the proposal I'm putting, that we will reconvene on Tuesday week to finish our discussions. Is that okay with everyone? That's fine. That's uh, agreed, agreed, Chairman. Tuesday the 20th, Chairman, is it? Pardon? Is that Tuesday the 20th? Yes, that's correct, uh, Mr Kavanagh, yeah. Thank you. And uh, if, as I said, if this was non COVID times, we'd continue for another hour or two. But I can't do that. I'm under six orders from the count quarter to finish within two hours. So we're meeting on that Tuesday anyway as a committee. So I'm suggesting that we have a second session um, to finish our discussions here. OK. Uh, the, committee, Thank you very much. the committee is now adjourned. Thank you, Thank you, Chairman. Our committee is now adjourned until 3.30 on Tuesday the 13th of July when we will have a meeting with the Irish Race House Trainers Association and the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair.